What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Naught of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Welcome tonight to 5.30. Glad you're here. Come on in. Those are coming in now. These are the announcements. Um, Gail McDonald is in Baptist East at ICU being tested. Um, Lucy Clifton has been released to go home today. It was confirmed Monday that Marcia Sutton does have um, problems with cirrhosis of the liver. Prayer for her and for Randy. James Powell family is in the, in the passing of her mother, Darlene Baxter, uh, last Saturday. Her funeral will be Saturday the 16th at the Johnson Funeral Home in Moreover, Alabama. Visitation will be at 1 o'clock and the funeral at 2. This Sunday, September the 17th, uh, lads and leaders and uh, leaderettes will have their kickoff potluck lunch in our fellowship hall right after the AM service. Those bringing food, please drop it off at the kitchen area prior to the Bible class. And prison needs are toothpaste. We rejoice in heaven over the baptism of an inmate at Red Eagle Correction Facility last night after Mike's New Life Behavior class on First Peter. That's always a great work and appreciate Mike and what he does with that. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for every opportunity you've given us. Thank you, Father, for the rain, the sun, uh, every blessing. We know that all come from you. We give you thanks and praise. But especially, Father, we're thankful for the spiritual blessings we have in Christ Jesus. Your son, Jesus, his life, his death, the shedding of his blood, the coming in contact with that blood, and the hope we have of living with you eternally one day in a place called heaven. Help us tonight, Father, in our study. May we learn truths we can apply to our lives, serve thee even better. Thank you, Father, for this good congregation, for these who come out tonight. In Jesus' name, and amen. I wanted to give you this because I think some of us need it. Um, how many of you know how to text on your phone? Okay, four of you. All right. This is texting for seniors, in case you didn't know what this means. BFF, best friend just fell. Uh, BTW, bring the wheelchair. Y'all need to write these down. You might need, well, TTYL, talk to me louder. BYOT, bring your own teeth. Uh, L-M-D-O, laughing my dentures out. <laughs> F-W-I-W, forget where I was. Amen to that. Uh, I-M-H-A-O, is my hearing aid on. And then this one, R-O-F-L-A-C-G-U, rolling on the floor, laughing, and can't get up. Well, <laughs> I don't know if you have those kind of problems or not. Ma'am? I am hitting right at home. <laughs> Turn, if you would, to 1 John. John, the old preacher, uh, he wrote five books. And uh, these, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, are some of the last he wrote. He's an old man. And there's one thing that follows being old, and that is death. And so John's probably thinking further ahead at his death. So when you going to die, you want to tell people that you love 
what's on your heart. Um, people pass away all the time, and one of the questions we ask is, what was the last thing you said? Just like when Jesus went died on the cross. What was the last thing he said? Well, he told his disciples, you know, you believe in God, believe also in me, Father's house, many mansions, John 14. This is John's last words. And John was concerned about the church. He was concerned about this group of Gnostics coming in and teaching a false doctrine. The doctrine was that Jesus Christ never came in the flesh. And John says in chapter 1, verse 1, no, I heard him, I saw him, I gazed upon him, and I touched him. I know he came. He was manifest, made known to me. And so what John wanted us to know is what he knew. John said, I'm writing this book that your joy may be full. Uh, and I told you last week that there are joy robbers out there. Don't let anyone rob you of joy. Um, don't dwell on the bad. If you're going to dwell, dwell on the good. This past Sunday, we were not in Camden where we go usually Sunday morning, but we were in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville is the last work I had before I moved here and started working for Faulkner. Um, I wasn't fired, but I was told to write a letter of resignation. <laughs> so I did, and they accepted it. So I call that whatever it is. And I thought, this is terrible. I, I, I was going to retire in Jacksonville. Uh, I had all my plans made to stay in Jacks, the houses being almost paid for and all that. But now, as I look back, I wouldn't have known, uh, I wouldn't have known, I wouldn't have known a lot of things. I wouldn't have known Jeanette. If I'd stayed in Jacksonville, I don't think we'd ever got together. And I'm thankful to God that we have. I was asked to come back last Sunday to Oceanside. And I had mixed emotions about that because, you know, I was let go, whatever you call that. But I decided a long time ago, since it's been 20 years, to let that go, not dwell there. I, if you're going to dwell on something, dwell on something good. In fact, we're told of whatsoever things we think of, you know, think on good things, pleasant things, holy things. Don't think on the bad things. If you spend time wasting your time thinking about how bad things are, I guarantee you, you've lost a lot of time. Uh, I've been treated bad, preacher. Well, hello, we all have. But now as I look back, you know, stand back and look at, it's been pretty good. A lot of great things have happened. I wouldn't have known University Church if, uh, if I'd stayed in Jacksonville. I wouldn't have known the elders. You, we, I'm telling you, we've got some good elders, folks, just godly men. I wouldn't have known any of them if I'd stayed in Jacksonville. What I'm saying is when things that are bad happen, if you're a child of God called according to his purpose, all things work together. Can you finish it? For good to those that love God, those are called. It works out. God has a plan, and it works out. So when bad things happen, okay, that's bad. Let's pray about it and do what we can, but let's don't dwell on it. Let's dwell on what's good and what's uh, uh, pleasing to God. So we're in chapter 3 tonight, and I want to finish this if I could. Um, let me see. I marked it. Where am I? Yes, verse 13. Uh, this first statement John makes is kind of telling. Do not marvel if the world does what, class? Hates you. That's, that's a strong word, hate. Dislikes you? Okay, I can understand that. But hates you? Why would the world want to hate us? Well, if we're doing what we're supposed to do, being what we're supposed to be, saying what we're supposed to say, then we're a walking contradiction to the world. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, be transformed by renewing your mind. We're to be different than the world. So if I act like the world, talk like the world, dress like the world, think like the world, guess what? <laughs> I may be of the world. So when we do what we should do as Christians, 
and the world sees that, it's a contradiction to their life. Well, uh, the boy went off to, to military school. Well, not school, but went off to military service in the Marines. His mother was concerned about him because he'd been brought up in the church. She had taught him everything she knew, and she was scared to death those Marines would, would change him. And so he went through basic training, boot camp. And the first time he got a call, he called his mama. Mama said, how are you doing, son? I know you're a Christian among all those boys. How are you doing? He said, mama, don't worry. Nobody here knows I'm a Christian. Hello? He missed it, didn't he? He missed it. Don't be, don't marvel not that the world hates you. Well, let's see what Esther says. We know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Count how many times John says, love the brothers. To hate not the brothers. You say you love your brother and uh, who you've, who you've seen and hate, uh, say you love God whom you've not seen and hate your brother whom you have seen. No, love the brethren. And he starts it off right here. He'll continue doing that. Evidently, there was a real problem with that. So John, the old preacher, said, let me, let me tell you what's on my heart. I want everybody to love everybody. And the word love here is the agape love. That, that says, I love you in spite of what you do, not because of what you do. There are some people that's easy to love, aren't there? I mean, there's some people that you're around and they're encouraging and they're helpful and they try to, you just love to be around them. And there's some people, well, maybe I shouldn't say, <laughs> that you'd rather not be around. I'm supposed to love everybody. Hello? I, agape loves, well, they treated me bad. It doesn't make any difference how you're treated. He didn't say, love them if they treat you right. Who did Jesus love, class? Everybody. They treat him right? Hello? No, no. You don't love, if, if you love those who speak to you, those who are good to you, you don't do any better than the Pharisees do. No, we're to love everyone whether we're treated right or not. And it's wrong not to love because love is a decision you make. When the couple come up, you know, and, and make the vows and all that and, you know, all the dress and all, they say, I love you. It's a decision. It's not a warm feeling inside, although you might have that at a wedding. It's a decision you make that I'm going to live with you the rest of my life. Will it all be good? Will it always be great times? Married couples, hello? No. But I'm going to stay with you. No, you cannot run me off, Jeanette. <laughs> Even with a cat. Can't do it. Can't do it. Why? I have decided to love you. And that's what that's what I got. That's why I can say, love everybody. Oh, I hate what he does. Well, you might hate what somebody does, but you love the person even though he does that. Look at verse 15. Whosoever hates his brother is a what, class? Murderer. Wait a minute. I may hate you, but I'm not going to shoot you. How, how can I, by hating you, be a murderer? Because the seed of hate is what produces full-grown murder. So I, I'm not going to hate you. I, you don't know what I can do to you. Well, you can do to it, but I'm still going to hate you. I'm still going to love you and care for you, even though uh, you might do the wrong thing to me. Look at what he says. We know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. And he who does not love his brother abides in death. Again, Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Can you be forgiven a murder? 
There was a time, Mike, when I was doing prison work, we had more members of the church on death row than any denomination. I don't know if that speaks well of us or bad of us. <laughs> I had the Bible class. I had the class, so we had baptism, a uh, number of uh, inmates who had committed murder. And some of them were real concerned. Can I be forgiven of that? I said, absolutely. The blood of Jesus is more powerful than your murder. If you repent, and what's repent mean? It means to turn around and do the right thing, doesn't it? So it's not just, you know, I'm sorry. But we had uh, a number of inmates that uh, we baptized who had committed murder. And some things I won't even talk about. Can they be forgiven? If, if, the, if, if Paul, who's a number one sinner, isn't he? He called himself that, chief sinner. If he can be forgiven, can't we be forgiven? If Peter, who when the Lord really needed him, cursed and swore he didn't know Jesus, was forgiven, can we be forgiven? Yeah. Yeah. Even though we may have committed some uh, heinous things. So by this we know because he has laid down his life for us. Who has laid down his life for us? That's Jesus, okay. Laid down his life for us. And we ought also to lay down our life for, uh, for the brethren. Wow. That takes loving the brothers a step further. Turn to Ephesians 5. Look at verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, 25. Husbands, what does it say, class? Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. What did Jesus do for the church? He purchased it with his own blood, right? Come on, is that right? Yeah. If Jesus laid down his life for the church, husband, you ought to lay down your life for your wife. That puts, <laughs> that puts it in a different flavor to me. I mean, I'm to die for my wife? Yeah. Yeah. I may have told you, I'll tell you again. I'm not going to tell about the bicycle, though. Mike asked, asked me about that. Um, in Mississippi, we had an elder, had five brothers. They were physical brothers who were the five elders of the church there. And um, the oldest brother, R.V. Hunt, uh, I'd preached a sermon on love and uh, how we're to love our wives and even give ourselves for it. You know, somebody came in my house to hurt my wife. Well, I'd do whatever I could to stop that. And I, he told me he would not. He said we're not to hurt people. Um, he was a pacifist and a capital P. I said, you mean to tell me if somebody broke in your house, wanted to harm your wife, you wouldn't do anything to him? He said, no, I might convert them. I said, well, you must not love her very much because the Bible says even give your life. So I'm going to love you, but don't break in my house to harm my wife. Now, the cat, that's another thing. But my wife is something else. We ought to love one another even as Christ loved the church. I'll tell you what, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 5 for a few minutes, Sermon on the Mount. He talks about murdering. Chapter 5 of Matthew, Sermon on the Mount, verse 20. For I say to you that uh, unless your righteousness exceeded the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, you will in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. By the way, that's a strong statement, isn't it? What do scribes and Pharisees do? What do the Pharisees do? They set themselves apart, that's what the word means, to do what? Study the law, to try to figure out the Messiah coming. Um, they gave, you know, a tenth of everything they had. Okay. You have heard that it said, those of old, you shall not murder. And whosoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, whosoever is angry, wait a minute, with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever say to his brother, Reka, which is empty headedness, shall be in danger of the council. Whosoever say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Uh, 
anger, Reiko, you fool. Be careful what you do and say about your brothers. Therefore, if you bring your gift, listen to this, to the altar and remember and come to you to the offer. And uh, first you be reconciled to your brother and then, then come and offer your gift. You mean to tell me there's something more important than worshiping God? Yes, sir. Yeah. You get it cleared up, your brother that you're having a problem with or your sister, get that cleared up, then come worship God. Well, why would that be? Why would that be that way? Because if my mind is on upset about a brother or sister, what they did to me or said to me or acted toward me, then I really can't worship God. So Jesus says, if you want to worship God, you get your life cleared of the hatred and whatever first, then come worship God. I've known some people treat some people really, really bad. Really bad. And who said, I hate what they did, but I still love them. I've known some kids that we've had who really treated their parents bad. And the parents hated what they did, but never quit loving the child. Isn't that the prodigal son? Isn't that the story? What did he do? Terrible things he did. Living with the harlots, his brother said. Spending all the money. It's all gone. Came back, you know, naked, no shoes or anything else, whatever he had on. And yet his father never quit loving him. Because that's the command. That's the decision you make. I'm going to love you. You're my brother. No, you're my son. You're my daughter. I may hate what you're doing. It, it hurts me to see what you're doing, but I still love you. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, verse 23 again, and remember that your brother has ought against you, leave your gift before the altar, go and first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your, your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're still in the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over the officers, and the officer will put you in prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you paid all, even the last penny. Well, um, murdering is pretty bad. That's a pretty bad situation. Yet, we're still to have love for our brothers. Any questions about that? Have I beat it enough, bro? It's interesting to me that uh, he says if we have all against the brother, that we go to him. If we are about to give and we realize our brother has all against us, we go to him. So whether we're the offender or the offendee, we ought to meet on the way okay. going to each other. Do you hear what he said? No. Okay. If we're if we're gonna if we're the offender or the offendee, either way, we're to all forgiveness. Where to go, no matter. Wouldn't that solve a bunch of problems? I mean, you said something that hurt me the other day. I don't, going out here, and you said that, and it hurt my feelings, and I'm just rooting over that thing. I just need to give you a phone call or maybe a text. Or better yet, go by and see eyeball to eyeball and say, did you really mean that? That hurt my feelings. You know what will probably happen? Just maybe get slapped, but you know what probably will happen? I didn't mean that. I'm sorry that hurt you. Will you forgive me? Absolutely. But you see, they, I can't get, they can't give me forgiveness, or I can't give them forgiveness, unless I, they know about it. That's why he said you go. Uh, I know people holding grudges that have held it for years, and the person they're holding the grudge against has no idea that that's what they're doing. Who's that hurting? Who's that hurting? Well, hurting the one holding the grudge. That's what it is. Don't, don't do it, folks. Just, just don't do it. I know it's easier said than done, but just don't do it. Okay, look at verse 16 again. By this we know we know love. Well, how do we know it? Because he laid down his life for us, and he also loved to lay down our lives for the brethren. Whosoever has this world goods, here's one way to show your love, 
and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? There is a, on TV yes, last night, there is a, a lady over in uh, Selma, they was Selma. Her house burned down. Along with that, the car caught on fire. And they were appealing for people to help. So I love you. I'll pray for you. What do we do to our brother or sister in need? Hello? Yeah, help them. Uh, I don't know the number right now. Uh, maybe, Scott, you have the, the, the total number of benevolent work that we've done this year. Uh, it's, it's huge. It's huge. Sometimes we've asked for special contributions for that. It's huge. People in need, desperate need, not just a dollar here and a dollar there, but big no dollars. What does that show? Our love. Will you help people that, you know, are kind of, no, no, we help anyone, anyone. Um, in fact, we need somebody to take over Tom's job now. Uh, I mean, yeah, Tom Edwards. Uh, he did such a good job. Well, you, you see your brother in need, you ought to give to him. And if you don't have, you don't do that, you don't have love of God body. My little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but what? In deed and truth. Anytime there's someone goes to the hospital or sick or needs prayers or something happened or death or whatever, um, Sharon sends out to us elders, you know, and we'll almost always put on there praying for you or we'll pray for you or praying for you now. Uh, we're the only one who sees that, I guess. Sharon sees it maybe. But um, uh, we want people to know that we care about them and in need. Love in word is easy. Love in tongue is easy. I love you. Well, good. My granddaddy, bless his heart, rest his soul. He sat on the drugstore bench out front in the drugstore. I can see him right now. And he'd sit there, and if anybody passed by, I'd say, you love me? And they thought, this crazy old man. You know what he'd say to them? Well, I love you if you love me or not. And I think he, was, he meant that. We're to love one another. But it's easy to say and size do. And I, I mentioned this. So I'm sick and you've come to my house and maybe you brought me a pie or a chocolate pie at that. Key lime is my favorite. But anyway, you brought me a pie. And as you walk out the house, you see that the grass is about knee high. What do you say before you leave? Is there anything I can do? Hello? Just, just let me know. The dishes are, you can't even see the sink. The refrigerator's empty. Anything I can do? Well, I, I, mean, I mean that. Yeah, I mean that. But what I need to do is get the mower out or get the dish pan out and wash the dishes. It's easier to say I love you than show you I love you. Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen? Okay, Cecil, amen me. It is. Love in word, yes. Love in tongue, yes. But love in deed and action. Let me see your love. Um, well, we could spend a long time on that, I guess. So we're to show our love in deed and in truth. Verse 19, and by this we know that we are, the, we are of truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God because we're doing the right thing. We're showing the right love. We're trying to be what he would have us to be. Verse 23, whatever we ask, 
we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Have you prayed a prayer and just and saw the answer to it with what you ask? Whatever we ask? Boy, oh boy, I have. <laughs> I don't have, I can't tell you how many times. And I don't believe in con just coincidence. I believe God answers our prayers. He says he does. Does God hear your prayers? I, I love the story about Cornelius in Acts 10. Cornelius was a righteous man, one who gave alms. Did God recognize his alms? He wasn't a Christian. Did God recognize him being good to people with his alms? He wasn't a Christian. Did he? Absolutely. Yeah. Cornelius prayed to God. Did God hear Cornelius' prayers? He wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a baptized believer. Did he hear his prayers? Says he did. In fact, he even told the man, who wouldn't talk to him? He said his alms have gone up and his prayers are memorial. God hears our prayers. Now, he may not answer them the way we want it. The answer may be absolutely no. But God hears our prayers and answers our prayers and many times answers as we ask because he knows our needs. Uh, I love praying. I, I love praying. I enjoy praying because I know that God is listening to me. Can you imagine? Just think of that, though. We've got God Almighty, God Almighty, taking time to listen to me, taking time to hear what I'm saying in my little feeble mind. God's listening to me. If I got on the phone tonight and tried to get our president to tell him what I'm thinking about the country, you think I'd get through? No, uh, well, okay, now that's far enough. That's far enough. <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, I wouldn't get through, folks. Let's be honest about it. He's too busy for me. But God's not. God's not. Don't let this great blessing of prayer go unused. And then he listens to me not only as just a, a man like Cornelius trying to be right, but he listened to me as a, a son, an adopted child of his. Now we're, now we're really getting into it. Because it's one thing just to pray and, you know, be outside the family, but now inside the family, as a child of God, he listens to me. And gives me, blesses me with everything I need. Answer is sometimes no. Is that an answer? Is no an answer? Yeah. Yes, it is an answer. Remember when our kids were saying, you know, can do this, do that? No. Well, why not? Because I said not. That's why. There's a country song, my greatest blessing to unanswered prayer. Cecil said, country song is my greatest answer, and my greatest blessing is unanswered prayer. Isn't that right? Uh, I remember girlfriends I prayed for in school, and thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. Verse, <laughs> my face turned red. Verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on his name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So John said, let me sum this up. Let, let me get down to the, where the rubber meets the road. Here, here are the two things. Number one, we should believe on his name, Son of God, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Now, that word believe doesn't just mean accept, you know, there's a God in heaven. That encompasses all our faith. That, that means belief is doing everything he said to do. He's already told us to keep his commandments, and those commandments are not grievous. All right, verse 24. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides, stays in, abides in him, and he, Jesus, in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit. What Spirit? Our Spirit? Is it capitalized in your Bible? 
Holy Spirit, yes. The Holy Spirit was given to us to show that we are, number one, children of God, and also to help. You know, Jesus says this to the disciples, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to spend, I'm going to send someone. I'm going to send, what do you call him? The comforter, and he will comfort you. What's the Holy Spirit do? Well, one thing he does is comfort us. He stands beside us. He helps us. Gave us the word, I know that. But he's also the comforter whom he has given us. So he abides in us by whom we know. He'll give, and it's the seal. It's the very seal that we're a child of God. In fact, um, wasn't there an occasion where Paul was going through and uh, asked some people about their baptism? Have you received the Holy Spirit since you were baptized? And they said what? We don't know what you're talking about. We didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. And then he immediately said, well, then how are you baptized? You can't be, you can't be taught wrong and baptized right. You're going to be taught right. And well, we were baptized by John. Remember that? John's baptism, which was right at one time. But now since Christ came and lived and died, now then there's a difference. And so he told them to do what? In Acts 19. Be baptized again. Be baptized again. Um, we had, what was it, Wednesday, no, Wednesday night that, that Mitch preached. A young man came forward. He said, I was baptized and I was real young. I don't think I knew what I should do. Don't think I knew enough. I have real doubts. You know what I told him? Let's do it again. Let's do it again. So if the first one was right, then the second won't hurt. And if the first one was wrong, then the second will be perfect. Let's be baptized again. I, uh, our three girls, since they're, you know, preacher kids, they all want to be baptized very, very young. We're talking about nine years old, ten years old. And uh, the middle daughter was baptized, I think, when she was ten. And she called me about hmm, eight, nine years ago. I was living here. And she said, Dad, I think, I don't know if I knew what baptism was for. I, I've got some doubts. Would you be upset if I asked you to baptize me again? I said, no, absolutely not. Now, she's grown, got two daughters. No. You need to make your salvation as what? Sure as you can, right? So if it means being rebaptized, okay, I'll do that. If it means confessing wrong, I'll do whatever it is. I want to, whenever he comes back or whenever I die, I want to be ready, folks. It's not get ready. I want to be ready. So whenever the Lord comes back, we were talking about that earlier lady, um, that's okay. I'm ready. Or if I should die between now and then, I'm ready. I just hope tonight everyone in this audience Oh, hundred dollars or so, ready. In fact, the early church would say this when they left each other, Lord, come quickly. Lord, come quickly. Wouldn't that be wonderful? If you're ready, it's wonderful. If you're not ready or have doubts and all that kind of stuff, it's not good at all. So I hope tonight you're ready. We'll start with chapter 4. We did get through chapter 3. Chapter 4, next week, Lord willing, the testing of the spirits because there are false spirits coming in and John wants the church to know about that and he writes about that um, in this little book. Let's close with a prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for every blessing. Thank you, Father, for the answer to prayers in your will and your way. Holy Father, thank you for your word which helps us to see the need to be ready for that day when our life is taken or you come back. Help us, Father, to be ready in every way. Ask forgiveness of sins and ask for a safe trip to our home tonight and a good day tomorrow. Your will be done in Jesus' name and amen. All right, is that him calling back?
You, you got to watch. I'll take a sheet from a Hawaiian. You can take it. I love
in there. Oh, yeah, I see him. He's there. Okay. I'm on. Good, 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 good. <clears throat> good evening. Glad to see everybody here. And all of you folks who are out there in TV land. I always wanted to say that. I don't know why. I probably won't say that anymore, so enjoy it while you can. I have a few announcements we need to make. Gail McDonald is at Baptist East ICU being tested for, let me see, looks like myeloferosis or nothing. Fibrosis or something like that. I don't know what that is, but she's been tested for it. I can't even spell it. I can't even say it. Lucy Clifton was released to go home today. Marcia Sutton does have cirrhosis of the liver, and uh, we need to pray for her and Randy. The James Powers family, uh, passing of his mother, Darlene Baxley, last Saturday. And her funeral will be this Saturday, September 16th, at the Johnson Funeral Home in Moreauville, Alabama. The visitation is at 1 p.m. and the funeral at 2. This Sunday, September 17th, our last leaders will have their kickoff party. Am I still on? Okay. Uh, in our fellowship hall right after the AM service, those bringing food may drop it off at the kitchen area prior to Bible class. They had a baptism out at the prison, and they still need toothpaste. So if you have time when you're out, get some toothpaste, give it to Mike, and they'll, he'll take it out to the prison. Anybody else have any announcements? Anybody know anything about the maze? Is he sick? They were at the first service. Well, they usually say for both. But if they were here, yeah, okay. Just want to make sure. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our righteous Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day and for the blessings. We're thankful for every opportunity that you give us to study your word. And we pray, Father, this will increase our faith. That we will become stronger in doing and understanding your will. That we may be examples to others and that they may glorify you in all that we do. Forgive us of our sins, and finally, Father, save us in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're on lesson six. See if you got if that's the one I gave you. I think I did. And if you need a, another a copy, I have some extra copies up here. I tried to get around and give everybody one that was here. But I think some of, some of you came in after I worked my way back up front, so... But I do have it if you want it, and you can have it now, or you can have it later, or you can not take it at all. It's up to you. But we're glad you're here. Uh, we've been studying the book of Romans. We're up now to chapter 4, uh, which is an amazing chapter. In fact, the whole book is just, sometimes you, when you read it, you wonder, how come I didn't know that before? And I've encouraged the class that every day during this class that you'll read at least one chapter from the book of Romans. Uh, and please, by the time you come to this class, have the chapter that we're studying. At least read that chapter. It'll help you a great deal. Uh, if you remember, and we've talked about this already before, that the Jews had a great respect for Abraham. In fact, they held on to that uh, position that they were the children of Abraham, and, and probably even still today, uh, those that are still Jewish uh, in their religion are still looking to uh, Abraham. And they still believe, uh, if they are, that, uh, that they're justified by the works of the law. Uh, Paul spends quite a bit of time in Romans showing that that's not the case. And even 
Even Abraham was not justified by the works of the law. And Paul's going to, to prove that to the Jews and, and to anybody that would read it. Uh, he referenced, he begins out in chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Now we've talked about that already. And I'm sorry, <coughs> I'm looking at the wrong, wrong fountain. That doesn't sound right. I hope you all are in chapter 4. I was in chapter 8. I, uh, <laughs> I was working on that chapter today, by the way, and that's why I had it in my mind. I'm just a little ahead. Uh, this is not a prepared lesson. I'm, in other words, when I took this class, I'm working right along with you. I have not, I don't have any, I'm making the notes while you're reading them, basically. So, uh, I'm up to chapter 8, as you just noticed. So, uh, just let you know that we're in chapter 4. And he says, what shall we say then, that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Now he's simply telling the Jews that if you're going to be glorified by works, it's not going to be to God. It will be, you'll be glorified in the eyes of man. And, and you know how good that will do us. And men do that. Men have people that they look up to. And, and rightly so. Uh, there are good people who are doing righteous things. They're being good examples. And, and being a Christian, you should be a good example. And people should be looking to you. But this is not what he's talking about. He's talking about people who think that they're justified by the works of the law. And you and I already know that the law was fulfilled at the cross. Uh, the Romans were being good Christians. They were still doing things, mostly Gentiles here. But the Jews were still under this assumption, even at this time, that uh, they were still the children of Abraham. Even though today we're the children of Abraham by faith in the Spirit. And so God's children haven't changed. The children of God are still those who are living according to the will of God. Uh, that, that's been forever. Uh, the reason Adam and Eve were removed from the garden was uh, sin. And that's what takes us away from uh, righteous living. Uh, sin is prevalent. It will be here when the world ends. The thing of it is, we don't want to be a part of it. We want to be a part of the righteousness of God. And He has given us every opportunity. He gives us all the help that we need. And even when we're tempted, He says, it won't be beyond your ability to overcome it. And so it, this is it's a wonderful thing that we know because we are justified by faith without the works of the law. Well, sometimes we say, well, that means I don't have to do anything. And that's not the case either. We're talking about justification. We're not talking about full salvation. Salvation <coughs> requires that we do things, that we do work, that we do Christian works that we add to our faith, that we become better each day, that we serve God with a true heart out of love. And uh, this is a hard concept for a lot of folks to understand, especially the Jews who had been feeling like all along that they were justified by the works of the law. And they had a lot of things to do. Uh, if you go back and just look at in the temple itself, uh, what the temple workers had to do, what the high priest had to do, uh, what the prophets did. Uh, you can never say that they didn't work. Uh, their life was consistently involved in doing works. 
But they weren't justified by the works of the law. Just like we're not justified by the works of the law today. He insists on this justification and he spends a lot of time trying to make these folks understand it. So if you take this back into the time of the Roman church, uh, you can see it was new. It was something that hadn't been around a long time. And there were a lot of people being converted, probably on a daily basis. And they were babes in Christ. So Romans really comes along and talks about the difference in justification by the works of the law and the justification by uh, faith. And of course, earlier he proves this argument. Uh, he lets them know, and we've read some of that in chapter 1 all the way up through chapter 3. I need to get your copy here. Mine's a little different. But he gives every feasible, I believe, argument to the fact that the law was fulfilled. It's like having a glass of water. You put all the water that glass can hold, and it's, it's done. It's filled. Uh, you can't even put another drop in it if it has all that it can hold. Uh, sometimes I've tried that. Uh, I've filled up as far as I can fill it up, and almost to the point that it would raise just a little bit above the rim of the glass. And one more drop, and it would start running out. Well, this is what Paul is trying to illustrate in the first three chapters, that this is done. This is full. This was God's will. Not that the law was bad. Not that the law didn't do what it was supposed to do, because it did. And basically what the law did, it informed us of what sin is. Uh, if there had been no law, there would be no sin. Because sin is simply breaking the law. Uh, and it's so easy to understand that, that you wonder why it takes so much teaching and so much repeating the same thing for people to understand that sin brought the law, I mean, that the law brought sin to sight. People could see what sin was. Uh, all the way back to Adam and Eve. When they disobeyed the law that God gave them, they died. Now, not that moment, but they were separated from God. He took them out of the garden. And uh, there was another chance coming uh, for those folks. Just like we had another chance when we were in sin, uh, God says if we're willing to repent and be converted, repent and be baptized, we could have our sins remitted, taken completely away. And then he gives us a way to have sins removed day by day. And it involves the works of, that we do in the flesh. And he says he doesn't want you to do fleshly works in that sense. But we need to do the things that he, he talks about. He proves it by example, and this was the example of Abraham that we just read a moment ago. It says, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. In other words, if Abraham was justified by the law, then he earned it. He earned that justification. It became a debt. In other words, he did that. And, he, and if the law said, if you do this, then, then you'll receive this reward. And, and that will be a justification uh, for your life. But he didn't do that. That's not what Abraham did. Now, Abraham did do works for God. But he was justified before that. And this is what Paul is pointing out. In other words, all that are saved are justified in the same way Abraham was. 
And all the time, I believe, most of the Jews, maybe all of them, thought that was justification by the works of the law. Even today, we're not justified by the works of the law of Christ. We're saved by grace. And uh, people like to put a period there and even add another word and say grace only. But that's not the case. We're saved by grace through faith. Now, whether we want to realize this or not, faith is a work. Uh, Peter says that it is. James indicates. Now, would you show me your uh, faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. So that doesn't conflict with what Paul's saying here at all. Uh, we're under a new law, uh, and we're not under a law of works. We're under a law of grace through faith. And uh, without faith, we've talked about this, it's impossible to please God. I always like this verse because it goes on to tell us basically about faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Well, there's your faith. And he is a, he is a rewarder of those that, listen to this word here, diligently seek him. That's your works. You're diligently seeking to do the will of God because you love God and because you love others. And so we see it's, it's he was considered faithful, uh, thus his children were justified the same way. But had it been justification by the works of the law, then Abraham could have said, well, I earned this. Now, one thing we do earn and that is death. Uh, Paul is very clear on that. He says the wages of sin is death. So that means we're getting paid. Uh, we sometimes have a hard time uh, separating the love from God, the love of God from his judgment and his wrath. Uh, the Bible speaks about the wrath of God and the wrath of men, and it's completely different. So he goes on to say here in chapter 4, For what saith the Scripture, verse 3, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He said he believed God. Well, that's what faith's all about. You must believe in God. And you must believe in Christ, the Son of God. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if you think you're working your way to heaven and you believe in justification by works, uh, you're not going to make it. I can't make it that way. You and I could not even begin to earn our salvation. It's not earned. It is the gift of God. He has a plan for us. He has a way that we can go to heaven. He has the instructions. And we're following the instructions. And there's no instructions that God gives that you can't do. Uh, you can accomplish anything he tells you. He says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So you're still talking, he's still talking about Abraham and the law Abraham was under. And it becomes a little confusing sometimes, maybe a little hard to understand, uh, that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Uh, when the Jews were circumcised, they felt like, well, you know, I earned this. I deserve this, uh, this being a child of God. And he says, uh, circumcision is nothing. Now, one time it was something. Uh, it was a covenant that God cut with the Jews, not with us, but with the Jews. So that was something that they had to do. That was something that was required. And when something is required like this, it becomes uh, uh, a work that they think is justification for who they are and what they became. 
He said, even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Uh, sometimes people take Romans, and that's why they can say, and they do say this, that we're saved by faith only. Uh, and of course, you know as well as I do, that faith only is only used one time in the entire Bible. And it says not by faith only. So that's good enough for me, even though I might not understand all I know about Romans, about what he's saying here. I do know this, that faith only does not save us. Nor did it save them. Uh, verse 8 says, Blessed is man to, of whom, or to whom, the Lord will not impute sin. So, how does that work? Well, he took your sin away, and it works today through the blood of Christ. Uh, you, you and I cannot justify ourselves no matter what we do. And as I said a moment ago, we cannot possibly earn salvation. It's a free gift of God, even though we have requirements and things we must do. Why was he justified? Well, if you look in Genesis 12, 1 through 4, 4, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. So that's the command that God gave Abraham. And we think, excuse me. I don't know why am I having such sinus problem tonight. But Abraham didn't do that right away. In fact, it was a long time before Abraham obeyed that command. First of all, he lived with his father for a while. And when he finally departed from his father, he took his nephew with him. And you know how that turned out. Never does man's works justify him in a way he can make it to heaven? Never been so. It won't be so today. He said, And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran, where his father was. So it was years before Abraham ever left, and then he took his relatives with him. Now what, did, what was the command? Now the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house. Now, he was not justified by the fact that he took his father and he took, his, took a lot finally and it became uh, a problem for them to live together. So, that's when uh, Lot took his group and went toward Sodom and Abraham went the other way. But still, because of who Abraham was and the heart of Abraham, he was justified uh, in what he was doing. And he was called the father of the faithful. Even though, <clears throat> like we sometimes, uh, don't quite get it. We don't quite get out of the life that we've lived. We don't quite repent all the way. And uh, God gives us time. Now, there'll come a time when our time will be up. And so, rest assured, you'll have enough time to do what you need to do to get to heaven. Uh, but don't tempt God in the sense that I'll wait a while. Uh, do it today. Uh, in the New Testament, you find when uh, people receive the word, they that gladly received the word were baptized. They didn't wait. Some in the middle of the night. Uh, some in the daytime. Uh, some at all hours probably uh, throughout that time when the early church was being uh, formed. 
Uh, and then there were those at that time that uh, were struck dead uh, because of their heart. Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, Peter said, why has Satan tempted you to lie to the Holy Ghost? And they died. And the men carried them out and buried them. Uh, so, uh, we're fortunate, I think, that that doesn't happen today. Uh, if it did, probably very few would be here, and I might not even be teaching this class if you just died because of, of something like, like that. Uh, so our heart has to be right. Uh, see, God knows uh, what kind of people we are and what kind of people we're going to be. And he gives us an opportunity, uh, really, I think, to change his mind. Uh, God did, on several occasions, change what he said, changed his mind. Hezekiah, he was told to get his house in order because he's going to die. And he had a pretty good argument for God. He told God all the things he had done. He said, okay, I'll give you 15 more years. So prayer, folks, don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. Prayer works. God wants to hear from you. God wants to know what you plan on doing and how you plan on doing it. Uh, God is all-knowing, but he doesn't cause you uh, to do things. But if you give your life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit will guide you uh, just like basically it guided the apostles and the people in the early church. Not miraculously, as they were guided. And don't ask me how it works, but I know it does. And if you don't have the Spirit, you're none of His. And so the Bible is very clear about that. And I have a lesson on, on that one time. Maybe we'll cover that before we get through with Romans. And so here we, we see that Abraham was not justified by works of the law because he didn't do what God said right away. Eventually he did, but he still had problems. And I think in, finally, and I think this is very significant, when, when Abraham uh, raised his hand to offer his son Isaac on the altar, his hand was stayed, and God said, now I know. Now he knew Abraham. And so the boy was saved, and Abraham believed God so much and had such great faith. In fact, he even told the people when he went into uh, the mountain with his boy and the sacrifice, being the sun and the wood and everything and the fire, uh, he told the people, said, wait here, and the boy and I will return. So he knew that even though he took his life, that God could restore him because this was the son that God specifically said, through your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And that was not of many, that was through Christ Jesus who is in the line uh, with Abraham, the father of the faithful. It says, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Genesis 15 and verse 6. This belief that he had was strong enough that it was counted without works that Abraham was righteous. So this is, again, we have to realize this is under a different law. This was a different people in a different time, long before the church was ever established. And in chapter 4, verse 20 and 21, Paul says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform. You see, that's a belief system that God counted in Abraham for righteousness. Uh, 
We have to have that type of system. We have to have that type of belief in our hearts. We have to believe that whatever God says is true. Whatever God wants us to do, we do. However God wants us to live, we live. And be strong enough in that faith that no matter what, we're heading in that direction constantly. Not going to the left, not going to the right, not turning around, not stopping, but following God with all of our heart, our soul, our strength, and our mind. Uh, this is a commandment that has been since the beginning and will be here all the way till the end. Uh, this word will not pass away. And so the same law that Abraham lived under, as far as righteousness is concerned, we are under today. Uh, even though it's not the law of Moses of sacrifices and all that. Because the sacrifice has been made once for all. And so we, that has been eliminated completely. There will never be another sacrifice made for sin that God's going to accept. Except. When you read Romans, you'll find out that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. He said, don't be conformed to this world, but ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. So we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, it's the same principle. Even though the law has changed, God has remained the same. He's not willing that any should perish. And he does everything that he can, short of making us do something, to see that we go to heaven. That's God's desire. He wants you in heaven. He wants you to be there in eternity. You hear people say, where will you spend eternity? Well, you won't. Eternity cannot be spent. We'll spend time on this earth. And once we spend all the time that we have, it's gone. It's like when I spend my money, it's gone. Don't have any more. So you can't spend eternity anywhere. You will be in eternity. You will exist in eternity. You will be there in the spirit. You'll either be with God or with the devil and his angels. So here is a man who believed God so much that it was counted unto him for righteousness without the works of the law. Not only did he believe, but willingly obeyed the voice of God. Uh, you notice here in James 2, and I mentioned this a minute ago, uh, verse 21 through 24, he says, you see then that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now on the surface that appears there's a conflict between James and Paul. But there's not. He's talking about an entirely different set of works that are required by faith. Uh, baptism, by the way, is not a work. We don't do that. Somebody does that to us or for us. But faith in itself is a work. And by faith we believe. Uh, faith causes us, causes us to repent. Faith causes us to be baptized for the midst of sin. Faith causes us to rise up to walk a different way. Now we're walking by faith, not by, faith, not by sight. And here's the scary thing that I'm still not really completely certain about. He said, if it's not a faith, it's sin. That's a pretty strong statement. I don't know if you've looked at that and studied it. I've tried, and, and it's, it's scary. No, if I'm doing things not by faith, I'm sinning. Now, I don't know all that that includes or what, what the whole uh, context of that is, but uh, if you think about that, it'll, it'll straighten out your life a little bit. It'll make you be very concerned about how you're living, what you're doing. 
why you're here tonight, for an example. Uh, why'd you come to a Bible study? Uh, what's your purpose for being here? Uh, so, you know, we've got to talk about that. In verses 16 through 20, he says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. So that should help us a little bit. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So now he makes a comparison between the two. And Romans does a lot of that. It gives us doctrine, uh, the first several chapters. I mentioned that in the introduction. Uh, the last gives us the practical way uh, to fulfill all these things that uh, Paul is talking about. And so if you hang in there, we'll cover the doctrine, and then we'll find out how to do it. And I think that's important. You know, there's a lot of things you and I don't know how to do. Well, at least I don't. You, you might know how to do things I don't know how to do. But there's a lot of things I don't know how to do. And I've lived few years and studied a lot and still just like you know if it's it's not a faith it's a sin I still have a little difficulty with that and uh, I don't have any difficulty with faith without works is dead being alone I don't have any difficulty with I can't make it by faith only uh, those are some things I I think I've got pretty well down uh, but I'm still a long way from understanding everything in Romans, in fact, or any other chapter or book. And that's why I think Paul told Timothy that we should study or do our best is really what it says. I think the King James says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling the right, the word of truth. That means do your best. That's what God requires. He requires our best in order to uh, be able to receive this grace that he has. You see, God gave his best. He gave us the greatest gift that man has ever received. And that was the gift of his only son. And it was a terrible death in agony. I even hate to think about it from time to time. But it had to be just the worst death you can even think about. And you and I probably pray that we'll die in our sleep. Just wake up, you know, in the arms of Abraham, if you will. Uh, how God has planned, I don't know. Or when, I don't know. But it's coming. He said, "At is it written, I made thee a father of many nations. Before him who he believed, even God who quickened the dead and calleth those things which be not as they were. That's kind of confusing when you look at that. Who against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So Abraham was taking all of this, everything that God said, he was believing it. Now, did he do everything God said? No. But he believed it. Are we doing everything God tells us, tells us to do? No, I don't think. I think there's some things that we can improve on and should be trying to improve on, trying to get better. Uh, this is a good class for us to, to study, to show the necessity of this great faith that this man had and that is uh, passed on through us. He said, he staggered not at the promise of God, though un through unbelief it was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now remember it said back there, if you give glory, if you think you... God owes you, then it's a debt. And God has to pay. 
but God doesn't know us. Abraham knew that. He didn't glory in man. Paul doesn't glory in man. He gloried in God. And that's where our glory should be. In fact, even when he says, you're the light of the world, your city built on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do, do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Now listen to the command. Let your light so shine before men that they may see what? Your good works. Now look at the last rest of it. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's why we're here. We're here to glorify God by what we do, how we live, what we say. The promise in verse 16 is the same as recorded in Genesis 12, 3, Galatians 3, 29. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We're heirs with Abraham. Now go back and read about Abraham and you'll see Abraham was the father of the faithful. Abraham's with, with God now in his presence. Of course, we're all in his presence. He's just a little closer maybe than we are. But you remember when the rich man died, he was buried, but Lazarus was carried up by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. So we know where Abraham is. And we know where the rich man is. Now we've got to decide, do we want to be the rich man or the poor man? Do we want to be the beggar and be humbly begging the Lord and giving thanks for what he's given us? Or do we just want to walk on our own and say, I did it all myself? And that's a choice we need to make. Paul describes and commends Abraham's faith in 1722. And then he applies it to us. It says, Jesus delivered and raised up the sins for all, not just for the Jews. The end. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to uh, take them. Uh, if, if you have the lesson, you'll see there's some applications that you can do at home, some questions you can answer, and even some discussions that you can have uh, when you go home and, and you're thinking about this lesson and how good a job I did. Now, I wish I could do a whole lot better. But with what you have and the knowledge that this congregation has and this class, uh, I think you'll grow a great deal by doing a little more study. And uh, keep reading Romans as long as we're studying Romans, and it'll, it'll help you. And things will open up. First of all, before you go to the reading, pray. Ask God. He'll help you. He'll direct you. He'll give you things that you didn't think you could ever have. But that's God. That's what prayer is all about. Anybody have any questions? Any comments? Hello? See, that one answered and ended. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the day. We're thankful for this class and for the members here. We pray for them. Be with them, Father, that they may study and be approved in your sight. And, Father, they'll get home safely and, and be able to reflect on the things that we've learned and serve you better. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need a copy, I have some extra ones. Pardon?